Hello. 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 of the exhibition, uh, Hina Lemoana Wongkalu, who is here with us, who's going to be in conversation with our two guest speakers, uh, Tevita Okairi, as well as Adam Keabe Manalo Camp, who is joining us virtually via Zoom. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our three speakers before we begin, but you know, the format of tonight is that our speakers are going to share uh, their work in more depth, and then we're going to... Um, Come all together, we're going to have an open audience Q&A with both our in-person audience as well as our virtual audience. And um, let's see, we have book sales in the back for the Kapaimahu Children's book. With uh, I also just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Joe Wilson and Dean Hamer, who are also co-curators yes, of the exhibition. And I also just want to give a shout out to Miles Markham, who's here with us in the audience, who's featured in the exhibition in the Pacific Portrait section. Thank you so much for joining us. So, all right, we have our very esteemed guest speakers. I'm going to start with Adam Keabe Manalo Camp, who is a Hawaiian cultural historian, and he is of Kanaka Maoli and Filipino descent, namely of Ilocano and Kalinga. He is a published writer, researcher, blogger, podcaster. He is also the administrator of the largest uh, Hawaiian history Facebook group. So please do check that out. He is going to be uh, sharing uh, through his research uh, the importance of mahu historical figures uh, such as Kaomi in Hawaiian history. And so thank you so much, Adam, for joining us tonight. It's an honor to have you here. We also have uh, Tavita Okaili, who is professor of anthropology and cultural sustainability at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. He is uh, part of the faculty of culture and language and performing arts. And he is also the author of Marks of Indigeneity, uh, a Tongan art of, spatial, of social spatial relations. He's going to be speaking about uh, gender fluidity in Tongan deities and eco ecological knowledge. So thank you so much for your work and for sharing it with us here tonight. And last but certainly not least, we have Hinale Moana Wong Kalu, also very affectionately known as Kumuhina, who is a community leader, a Kanaka Maoli teacher, and cultural practitioner, and truly a, a leading voice in our community for uplifting and educating the community of the importance of Mahu. Um, just an anchor a voice of the exhibition, and just mahalo nui for being here with us tonight. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to transition to our presentations. Uh, Adam, you're going to do the honors of, of opening up our presentations tonight. Um, I'm going to be uh, showing, uh, we have a presentation from our computer, so I'm going to be showing that. But Adam, if you want to say a few words before I whip up the, the presentation, or if not, I can go straight into it. Okay, um, yeah, sure, I can say a few words. Um, so mahalo for inviting me into this space, and I'm incredibly humbled to be speaking with all of you today. Also, special shout out to Kumuhina for um, just being fabulous. So, <clears throat> uh, many years ago, back in the 1990s, while I was a teenager and volunteering as a docent at Iolani Palace, 
I was doing some research and I stumbled upon Samuel Kamakau's account of Kalmi from this book over here, Ruling Chiefs. A couple of days later, I ran into Jim Bartels, who was the curator at the time, and I asked him, do you know the account of Kaumi? Jim rolled in his heels back and forth, and then he said, well, you know, do you mean were they or weren't they? And then he paused, I paused, and then he continued, you know, back in that time, it was scandalous. But you know, within our Hawaiian culture, a hundred years before that, no Hawaiian would have batted an eye. Kaomi was my first encounter with an actual Hawaiian historical figure who was Mahu. As Hawaiians, we know that our ancestors accepted iconic relationships and Mahu. We know that during the time of our ancestors, they saw gender as being more than binary. They recognized that there was a fluid space between male and female. For myself, Mahu is the weaving of the experiences of both Kane and Mohine. It's like being able to shift between Kinulao while retaining the same Ano, essence. Historical narratives like that of Kaomi is not only important because represent representation matters, but it is an affirmation that Mahu have been, are, and will continue to be a part of our culture. It's also an affirmation of the far-sightedness of our kupuna and recognizing the ano of the person and the ano of existing as a mahu. That is why mo'olelo such as, such as kapai mahu and historical accounts like kaumi are so important to be told and retold. Okay, and <clears throat> Okay, um, can you skip to slide two? Okay. So, <clears throat> who, what is the time of Kaomi? So the time of Kaomi, as missionaries writers called it, uh, was a marked shift from complying to missionary inspired, to the missionary inspired social order, to actually resisting it. Kaomi is probably the least understood Hawaiian figure in the 19th century due to a lack of written sources written by him. Most of what we know um, of Kaomi is largely from Kaomi's opposition, um, from the works of Kamakau to Hiram Bingham, uh, uh, William Dewart Alexander, and other missionaries. Uh, they call him an infidel, and they emphasized his Parthian ancestry as a way to paint him as a non-Hawaiian, and thus othering him further. Uh, Kaomi is not only an important uh, and largely forgotten figure within Mahu LGBTQIA history, but also within Hawaiian history. Uh, Kamehameha III and Kaomi's Hulumanu movement was the last attempt by a Hawaiian monarch to, to challenge the established Calvinist political hegemony. Uh, next slide. So, <clears throat> and the next two slides, so three and four, is just a brief outline of what was going on right around the time that Kaomi was growing up. So at the time, Lahaina was the capital of the Hawaiian kingdom. Kahumanu was the region. Kamehameha III uh, was roughly 12 years old at the time. And then and a couple of years later, Nahi and Ena Kamehameha III attempt to marry. And this was encouraged by Boki. And of course, we know what had happened after that. They were not able to because the missionaries intervened. Um, in 1824 as well, the Hume Hume Rebellion broke out in Kauai. Um, then there was incidences of uh, race riots from the 1826 to 1827. I won't get into that too much. And then, next page. That's slide four. In 1827, Roman Catholicism gains traction due to Liliha and Boki's efforts. And this further clashes with American missionaries. And then 1829, um, Boki sells off and he 
never comes back again. So it's around um, 1832 that Kami appears with Kamehameha III. Uh, Kamehameha III and Kaomi's relationship is pretty open, that they're forced to actually confess in church. That was how widely known it was, that there was something going on between these two boys. Um, Kaomi, Kamehameha III is actually fined by uh, Kahumanu, or Moe Kolohe, which is a generic term for um, anything that the missionaries didn't approve of, uh, ranging from... Uh, sex work to homosexual activity to um, sleeping with someone who was not your husband. So, <clears throat> uh, next slide, slide number five. So, who was Kaomi? So, Kaomi Moi was the son of Jack Moi, uh, Bora Bora, and Naomi Kahua Moi, uh, Kahua Moa Moi. Um, Moi's sister was actually married to a Tahitian missionary by the name of Auna, who came with um, Toketa and Ellis, and they would be instrumental in actually helping um, develop the Hawaiian written language. So Tahitian missionaries in general at that time held huge influence in the royal courts. Um, they were perceived differently than the New England missionaries because Hawaiians and Tahitians uh, considered each other as kin. So there was a different type of influence going on. Uh, Kaomi was actually a student of his uncle, Auna, and he was also one of the first pupils of Hiram Bingham. Actually, he was the star pupil of Bingham. Uh, so Kaomi was well-educated in English and in Hawaiian, and he also spoke Tahitian. Um, he has classmates at the time included John E.E., and members of the Broya family themselves. So he was very well connected. Um, his family was actually attached to the court of Kahumanu. Okay, um, number six. And before um, Boki had left, uh, Kaomi had also studied under him. Um, Kaomi studied uh, La'au Lapa'au and was a Lomi Lomi practitioner. Um, in 1832, um, as I mentioned, Kaomi and Kamehameha III become very, very close um, because Kaomi has apparently a good sense of humor and he's very good at Laula la Pa'au. You can take it as you want to with that one. But he was also a great hula dancer and was supposedly, according to missionary accounts, he was an initiative, initiate into the Ari Oi um, uh, religious movement from his father. Uh, his father, by the way, doesn't appear to be uh, in missionary accounts. The father doesn't appear to have been particularly inclined towards Christianity. So, um, as I mentioned, um, Kahumanu tried to break up the relationship. Um, Kamehameha the Third is punished for it. Then Kaomi questions Kamehameha the Third's authority and calls him Mo'i Palapala, <coughs> Pala, the paper king. Next slide. So this is an actual quote um, from Wheeling Chiefs. I'm not going to get into it, but it affirms that Kahumanu knew about the relationship and did everything she could and to stop it. And um, when he was confronted by it, King Kamehameha III actually says to his Hanai mother, and who is at this point the Kohina Nui, let me work at hard labor as the law that I have made for the kingdom says, meaning he's not going to stop the relationship. He would rather pay fines and do hard labor than to break up with Kaomi. Um, <clears throat> shortly thereafter, um, slide eight. Ka <clears throat> shortly thereafter, Kahu Manu um, passes away and Kina U is named as Kohina Nui um, over the objections of both Liliha, who is now governor of Oahu, and Kaomi. Um, King Kamehameha III actually ignores the opposition, but the fact is that a group of Christian Hawaiians led by Kina'u, Kekauluohi, <clears throat> Kanaina, and Huapili uh, go to see the king and demand that Kina'u is named permanently instead of Liliha or Kaomi because they didn't want to um, have either one of them appointed as Kohina Nui. 
um, Hopili actually goes as far as to say that he would kill Liliha if she is appointed as Kohina Nui. So Liliha just maintains her position as governor of Oahu, um, and Hopili, her father, becomes governor of Maui. Uh, Kamehameha III also names Kaumi as Keali Kui, meaning joint ruler, and that title in itself connotates a marriage. Uh, they live together in Kamimi the Third's official residences, and they have a, a particular compound that they made for themselves and their um, their followers um, or like-minded friends that they dubbed the Hulumanu or bird feathers. So they all live together in Waialua. And um, slide number nine. So it's actually in... Um, <clears throat> around that time, the Kaumi formally leaves the church and he's staying over in with the Hulumanu in Waialua, while um, other prominent members are also staying with them, including Abner Paki, who is Bishop, you know, everyone knows who I hope who Abner Paki is in relation to um, Bernice Pohi Bishop. So King Kamimi III, um, as I mentioned, they live together. They're also doing things like they're reviving Hawaiian traditions in Wailua. They reopened the Lua school over there. They're rebuilding temples. Um, and the missionaries began a campaign um, in their pulpits against um, Kaumi, um, calling him out for his apostasy. They claimed that the Hulu Manu um, are also practicing polygamy, uh, polyamory, manufacturing alcohol at punch bowl, and doing all these other things. Um, Kaumi, in response, he actually openly questions the authority of the missionaries. And he asks a pointed question to um, Bingham, when will his people leave? Number 10, um, next slide. So all of this is going on in Oahu. Liliha is also part of this. Um, Elizabeth uh, Kinau, the Kohina Nui, decides that she needs to break down on this. And she starts promulgating um, laws against apostates in Maui and considers the Hulu Manu um, block to be an active rebellion against the crown. But um, she's unable to do anything other than yelling people because of the king's own involvement. Uh, not, and at this point, uh, Kina'u is also contemplating whether or not she should just resign and move to the U.S. Um, Kina'u makes an attempt to actually formally resign, but the king refuses to, ha uh, to accept the resignation of his sister. And um, it was during this time that the missionaries also began this rumor that's still within our history books that Kamehameha III and Kaumi were trying to establish absolute rule, absolute authority. But missionary accounts themselves show that Kamehameha III was still having council meetings and he still was not um, publishing edicts without the consent of his Kuhina Nui. Maui, Kauai, and Hawaii Island governors are also refusing to enforce anything that runs contrary to their own views. So they are actually ignoring the king's will on a lot of issues, um, simply saying that he's fallen into bad company. Uh, next slide, slide number 11. So in 1833, um, <clears throat> Kaikyo Eva, governor of Kauai, along with a servant named Kaihua, Kaihu, Sorry, uh, my font is very small on this note. Kaihu Hanua kidnapped Kaomi, um, and Kaomi's guards don't do anything. Uh, Kaomi is actually beaten and tortured. Uh, this can be considered the first recorded hate crime in Hawaiian history. Uh, Kamehameha III actually finds Kaomi because Kina'u uh, disapproves of the torture, and so she tells her brother. So he goes off, finds where Kaomi is, he rescues him, and they live together again. Um, but then at this point, uh, Hoa Pili and Kaikio Eva, with the support of American missionaries, 
are openly talking about a coup against the king and to replace him with his sister or with one of his nephews. So in 1834, after a year living together and with talks of an open coup with the backing of missionaries, uh, Kaumi goes into self-imposed exile in Maui in order to end the relationship with Kamehameha III so that way Kamehameha III will maintain the kingship. And Kamehameha III is then forced to marry uh, Queen Kalama and he adopts Alexander Liholiho, his nephew. And in 1835 or 1836, six, Kaumi sees Kamehameha III for the last time. And Kaumi disappears from history after that. So slide number 12. So what does Kaumi and his revivalist movement really represent? So Kaumi represented the first public renunciation of a well-known church member against the church itself. During the time of Kaumi, Hula and Lua were openly um, practiced on Oahu. Kaumi's movement also undermined missionary efforts to convert Hawaiians in rural areas by offering a Kanaka Maoli centered alternative. Many rural areas, such as Makua, were not converted until the 1850s. Several times in the 1830s and 1840s, Hawaiian chiefs were willing to dispose the king and to use violence to ensure the survival of Christianity within Hawaii. Kaumi tried to reshift the political and social landscape by challenging the Calvinist view of Christianity, as well as the supremacy of Western civilization itself. So Kaumi was an important figure that we don't really talk too much about. But as I mentioned, um, he is an affirmation of what the beliefs of our kupuna were. And in that sense, his story does deserve to be reclaimed and retold. Mahalo nui, Adam. I'm going to, um, we're gonna hang tight just a bit. Um, we're gonna transition into Tavito Ke'ili's presentation now, so I'm just going to whip this up. All right. Tapu moe tangata i whanua wai Pea moe motu o uh, Oahu Pea tapu mo kapai mahu Kinohi Kapuni o kahaloa Kwe kau mahu o waihi Mo tahiti o moa ula nui a kea Pea whakatapu atu ki a hikuleo Pea mo tafakula, mali mehe vao, pea pehe ki a fehuluni. Koe kau tangata, mo e otua, fefine, o tangata, o tonga. Kai ata, ai whangani, ke whakahoko atu, ai whatongi area o e ahoni. I begin with a uh, Tongan honorific salutation to share my respect to uh, the Kanaka Oivi of Hawaii, and especially to this place, to this moku of Kākuhi Heva. I also uh, express my uh, sacred reverence to Kapai Mahu, Kinohi, Kahai Loa, and Kapuni. These are the Mahu of Waihi and Tahiti, and especially for Moa Ula Nui Akea. And I also acknowledge the gender fluid deity Otua of Tonga, which is Hikuleo, Tafakula, Malimihevao, and also Fehuluni, so that I may be permitted to speak in this space on this topic. I want to also thank uh, Kumuhina, Joe, and also Dean, uh, Daniel, for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel. I'm deeply honored 
and also the staff of uh, Bishop Museum. And um, this uh, exhibition, the Healer Stones of Kapai Mahu, has allowed me to deepen my understanding of um, Tongan Otua, which I have done research for many uh, years, but especially to focus on their uh, gender fluid uh, dimension. So, malo apito and thank you. The title of my presentation is Otua, Gender Fluidity, Tongan Deities, and Ecological Knowledge. I will be speaking today about the gender fluidity Otua and their connection to ecology and the environment and caring for the environment. I ground my presentation on the Tava philosophy or the time-space philosophy of reality this was developed by uh, Dr. Augustino Mahina, who Fangahayako Malotu, a mentor, a Tongan anthropologist and historian, who talks about that reality is based on ta, which is time, and va, which is space. And ta is also an expression of maleness, and va is an expression of femaleness. And ta and va, ontologically meaning in reality, they're always together. Um, everything in reality is based on this duality of Da and Va. Now, epistemologically, meaning that the way people from different cultures do arrange this in different ways, so different societies have their own kind of understanding and configuration of time and space, or male and female, or red and black. I will be showing red and black, so this is kind of to show. I will also be looking at the idea of Hoa, which is that all things in reality come in Hoa, Hoa or Soa in Samoa, they come in pair, companions, friends. Uh, this is the idea that male and female are always coexisting. And also the idea of fanua, the oneness of humans and the environment. Land and its people. My early research was on tauhi fanua, which is the maintaining of social spatial relations with other people. But now I have been thinking about tauhi fanua, uh, from tauhi va to tauhi fanua, which is the relationship with um, the environment. I want to also talk about the concept of the future and past and present. In Moana Nui cultures, Mua is the past, which is always in front, guiding us, directing us. This is based on the work of Epeli Haofa, Lili Kalakamele Hiva, and many others who have been thinking about this idea. And I'm going to be going to a deep uh, culture to look at the way that some of these history is now in front of us guiding and directing us. Thinking about sort of things such as ancestors and marine life, avian life, and so forth. These are indigenous spirituality. By bringing this to the, to the front, I'm challenging the colonial erasure that happened during the process of colonization, where most of these knowledge were um, uh, erased. I want to begin with the pronoun yia, and this pronoun is a Moana Nui Akea pronoun we found here in Hawaii, ia or oia, which is gender neutral. So linguistically, we, we've seen this as both referring to both male and female. Um, but tracing this all the way back to the beginning of um, uh, proto astronesian which is about 6,000, 5,000 years that this pronoun have been used. So the, the pronoun yia is, is, is shown in, in all of the cultures. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about four main uh, Tongan uh, gender fluid otua. And otua here is akua, same in akua in Hawaiian. Uh, I think four is a good number since the mahu that uh, we are uh, celebrating are also four. And so to, tonight I'm going to be talking about these uh, otua. Havea Hikuleo, Fehuluni, uh, Tafakula, and Mali Mehevao. And I will show their genealogical uh, part. Now, what do I mean by gender fluid? In the Tongan language, it's referencing to somebody who is Fefine Motangata, or Tangata Mofefine, who are basically female and male, but also male and female. There are stories in our Talai Fonua. Talai Fonua is a story about the um, Fonua, the, the land and the ecology. That there are stories about these individuals who were sometimes males in some stories, but females in other stories. 
or that they go through a transformation from being male to female or sometimes from female to male. Again, Otua I'll be using, which is the cognate for Atua in, in uh, or Akua here in Hawaiian. And as a reference to ancestors who were deified, they were elevated to this, sta to this status because of their vast knowledge and skill. Mostly that their knowledge had to do with the ecology, with the environment and their connection to the environment. Another concept is fa'aikehe, which is ancestors from the other side um, and who have special uh, power. So Havehikuleo is an Otua, Fehuluni or Felehuhuni is a Fa'ahikehe, Tafakula is an Otua, and Mali Mehevao is an Otua. Now this is the Tongan cosmogony, it's similar to the Kumulipo. So I'm just gonna share with you that the line that I'm gonna be talking about, this is the Hikuleo line. So in the Tongan uh, creation story in the beginning was the ocean. And out of the ocean emerged the two first primordial being, Limu and Kele, and Limu and, and Kele is seaweed and, and sea sediment. And then from there, they uh, gave birth uh, to four sets of twins. The first sets of twins is the Hikuleo, where we see at least three gender fluid Otua, Hikuleo, Fehuluni, and Malimehevao. The middle one is the Tangaloa line, which is usually uh, known as Kanaloa here in Hawaii. The next is the Maui and the Hina line. And then the last one is the Nafanua line. The Nafanua line is often shown in, in Samoa uh, because this deity went back and forth between Tonga and Samoa and Tafakula comes from that line. So just to kind of give you the, uh, a map of where I'm going to be talking about. So let's start with Hikuleo. So Hikuleo as a gender fluid Otua, the first, um, anthropologists that came to sort of study Hikuleo. This was uh, Gifford, also published, his publication is, is, a, is a Bishop Museum publication. He was confused. He had the difficult problem, and this is, it was his writing. Hikuleo, the ruler of Pulotu, is portrayed sometimes as female, divinity, sometimes as male. And he spent his time trying to figure out exactly where Hikuleo is, basically saying, I was unable to settle the matter of sex of Hikuleo, in her or his role as deity of Pulotu. Some informant made the deity masculine and other feminine. And these are um, carvings of uh, Hikuleo. As you can see in the Kapai Mahu uh, exhibition, there is a, a um, uh, statue there of Hikuleo. So who is Hikuleo? Hikuleo is the highest ranking deified ancestor of Tonga, the highest ranking Otua of Tonga, so the supreme Otua, higher than Tangaloa, higher than Maui, higher than many of the other, other um, Otua. It's referred to as the deity of fertility, reproduction of human life in all forms, whether that's marine life, avian life, all land, and especially food crops. Hikuleo is also the guardian of vai and afi, or water, and also um, fire. And notice the, the, the duality between Vai and Afi, they're both in one person. So a person who has both of them creates this kind of holistic. Also the keeper of Vi Viola in Pulotu, and Viola is this uh, uh, water of healing um, that could heal all manners of sickness. And this one is where Hikuleo connects with the Kapai Mahu uh, group where the healing was also an important aspect of Hikuleo, and Hikuleo was in this um, area. Hikuleo is the chief of Pulotu. This is both the ancestral homeland, but also the afterlife for, for uh, Tongans. So Hikuleo was the deity of both life and afterlife. Um, very holistic in, in, in this. And because Hikuleo was the elder sibling of Tangaloa and Maui, uh, Hikuleo um, outranked them. Um, and here in this, you'll see Hikuleo here in a, a sperm whale a tooth. This is a carving of, of Hikuleo. Uh, one of the very few that we, we have today, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Now, Hikuleo continues to be someone who is the caretaker of all the um, volcanic island in Tonga. The origin of kava ceremony comes from Pulotu, from Hikuleo. So kava is a, also medicinal, uh, comes from this um, uh, Hikuleo. And then most of all the, what we call the most chiefly items, whether it's yam, 
or taro or talo or kalo, heilala plants, all of these are all belongs to Havea Hikuleo. There's a big harvest ceremony known as the Inasi ceremony, and this is a, similar to the Makahiki ceremony that happens when the rise of um, ma Mataliki or Makali'i, um, Pleiades. And this has happened in right now, June and July, where people would go and give offerings to Hikuleo. The Tui Tonga at the time, who's the, um, the king of Tonga, is a, a priest of Hikuleo the priests of Hikuleo receiving these crops as a way of maintaining the vow, taking care of the relationship with um, Hikuleo. And the idea is because Hikuleo is the um, otua of fertility, that by providing um, harvest to Hikuleo and Hikuleo's representative, that this will create abundance within the land. Now Hikuleo is also, uh, two of our stars are named after Hikuleo. Uh, one is the North Star, is named after Hikuleo, but also um, the star here that's known here in Hawaii is Hokulea, is named Hikuleo in Tongan. So we have two stars in Tongan that are named after Hikuleo. They're also recorded in our petroglyphs. So you can see here, these are petroglyphs that are both um, Hawaiian style petroglyphs that are in Tonga and in Hawaii. And you can see the, the petroglyph with the cross on the side is a representation of that star. So Hikuleo was also associated with, um, with ast astronomy and indigenous astronomy uh, information. Now, Hikuleo came in a form of a vaka. A vaka is like a kinolao in Hawaiian. So this is more of the ecological aspect of Hikuleo, where you see the sikota, uh, the kingfisher bird, is a form of Hikuleo. And people would uh, highly respect uh, this bird and its habitat. Um, the name of Hikuleo is basically echo, or um, echoes of the ancestors, or the reverberations of the ancestors. That's what the literal meaning of Hikuleo. Fehuluni is a grandchild of Hikuleo. So most uh, Tongans are well familiar with Fehuluni, or Felehuhuni is the name that most Tongans use. And this um, uh, Fa'aikehe, is shown in Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji. So the story is Fehuluni was first born as a male, Tuihatala. Uh, uh, and Tuihatala later became a female, uh, Fehuluni. And the story is that born in Tonga as Tuihatala, but then went to Pulotu, and then when returned from Pulotu, it became a female. But even today in the stories, Fehuluni can change back and forth, shift back and forth between male and female. Again, Vai is important. All the Vai in Tonga, all the waters in Tonga were brought to Tonga by Fehuluni from Pulotu, from the Viola of Pulotu. So everything that has to do with water and the ecology of water is connected to Fehuluni. The Kaho Kaho Yam, uh, one story came from Pulotu, the other is that Fehuluni went to Samoa and brought this from Samoa. And then also the water that created the origin of the new, the coconut, is, is also connected with um, Fehulun. This is a, uh, a, a film that was done by uh, Sisi Uno Helu, and they did a portrayal of, of Fehuluni. Uh, Diamond Langi here is uh, doing it. Most of the representation today of Fehuluni is female, so there has been very little to talk about Fehuluni shifting back and forth between male and female, so it's mainly been female. And so that part of the story has not been told, or people have not uh, brought that part of the stories up. Uh, just like um, Hikuleo Fehuluni is connected with the Sikota, the uh, kingfisher bird, and this sort of kind of indicate this kind of connection between Fehuluni and um, Hikuleo as a, as a grandchild. In the male form of Fehuluni, the Tuihatala form, Fehuluni comes in the form of a lei, which is the well tooth. And this is where I think the term lei first began, because in ancient Moana Nui, lei was well tooth, a well tooth. And all the, the necklaces or pentas that were made of it were called lei. So at first it was well tooth, and then later became probably used in flower. But this was the form of tuihatala. Uh, um, and you can see that the Hikuleo that we have here at the Bishop Museum, I believe there's only one here at the Bishop Museum, which is now displayed, 
is this one, which is also carved out of um, uh, the foi tofua or lei. Um, another sort of kind of connection to the way that Fehuluni and Tuihatala in its male form is connected to the ocean and the importance of the ocean and the ecology of this. Now I'm going to shift over here and talk about Tafakula. This is a member Tafakula. So one way to kind of keep it, keep, uh, the, these are um, descendants of the brothers and sisters of Maui and, and, and Tangaloa. So Tafakula is uh, the protector of land and mountains. And Tafakula was in human form, but could appear either as male, uh, man, or woman. And as a protector of land and mountain, uh, Tafakula was always appealed to and worshipped by Tongans for their crops, protection against hurricanes, cyclones, famine, and droughts. So there was a, an element about the weather and the climate that was controlled by Tafakula. Tafakula is basically the red edge and as a reference to the, um, the horizon, the horizon during the, the uh, dawn or the sunset. Now, Tafakula is seen as both a descendant of either Tangaloa or Kanaloa or, or a descendant of Nafanua. Nafanua is a very prominent individual in Samoan um, story, but in, in Tongan story, uh, Tafakula is a, a descendant. Uh, Nafanua and Nafanua's sister, they were represented in Pohaku, uh, very similar to the one that you have here in Kapai Mahu in, 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 in Tonga. And then the last one, uh, Mali Mehevao, uh, this is another uh, uh, otua, a, a gender fluid, which is, appears in the form of a lulu, an owl, and um, had the power of assuming either the male or the female sex, um, can reveal all sorts of truths, especially when family tries to hide different truths. Uh, the, the work of Mali Mehevao was to kind of sh uh, share that. The meaning of Malu is mean, uh, means to smile from the forest. And uh, there are some scholars who think that Malu Mehevao is just another manifestation of Fehuluni. Uh, again, a grandchild of um, um, Hikuleo. Now, I want to show the kind of the reason why I did this is to ground this in the wonderful work that uh, Joe, Dean, and uh, Hina have done on their film, Lady. Uh, ladies in waiting to show that the ladies in way in waiting show is grounded in a deep history of Tonga of gender fluidity that goes back thousands of years uh, as expressed by these Otua now there are some very interesting things here that I want to share when the early missionaries came to Tonga the first time that they record these terms for example Fafafafine. Uh, Fafafafine is uh, the, the Tongan version of Fafafafine in Samoan. In the dictionary, it says, a monster. A monster. To this day, scholars are still debating why they decided to call Fafafafine a monster. So, Fafafafine is basically the plural form for somebody um, that is uh, woman like. Yeah? Um, and the only way that I could think about this is this is sort of kind of the violence that were happening when the early, the, the first recorded, this was Reverend um, um, Rabone's 1845 dictionary, who began to sort of kind of attack this idea of Fakafafine. Um, and so from there, the terms with Fakafafine, and then um, most of the term that we use today is faka lady or lady in uh, lady is the transliteration of lady to act like a lady and that's the term that most tongans use today to refer to this but just to kind of give you a, a his history of sort of the violence that have happened to this particular kinds of um gender fluidity it gets worse than that hikuleo when the first missionaries came during the process of Christianity, would gather all the hikuleo and hang them. If you look close here, you can see the ropes that are still on hikuleo. Um, not only did they hang hikuleo, they mutilated her or him, depending on, uh, on, the, on the way that you want to use in the form. Um, and this is based on the work of the 
uh, Terangi Hiroa, the Maori anthropologist who was the director here at the uh, Bishop Museum in the 1930s, 1950. He was documenting these Tongan wooden figures and was just amazed at the, the violence that were brought about them. Now, we can only speculate why this violence happened. One is that perhaps maybe the Christ Christianity, when it came, it decided that they did not want these idols. Or perhaps maybe they were worried because these were gender fluid deities. And so, so much violence. I did not see these kinds of violence in other deities, only the, the ones that represented Hikuleo. So I'm you know, grateful that the, here at the Bishop Museum have a, uh, a, a replica or we have a form of Hikuleo. The one on the top there is the new iteration of this violence. That is Hikuleo on the auction. It was auctioned last year. The auction started at 2000. It was sold for $23,700. The one on top right there. Yeah. So not only that it went through the process of sort of kind of violence towards them, but then the ones that survived, the Hikuleo images that survived, are now commodified and sold in the open market in a very high amount, which is sort of kind of continuing on this particular uh, form of violence. But it's not all bad news. The good news is that there is a active reviving of Hikuleo. Um, this one is a tapa made by my former student, Visa Sio Sio Sao, um, for his um, Master of Indig Applied Indigenous Studies at the Wanang of Aotearoa. And he created a motif of Hikuleo in the uh, tapa. This is what that I use as the background of my mind. The one in the middle, Steven Fehoku who has been carving um, Hikuleo in Tonga. And then the last one is Tuyone Pulotu. Uh, Tuyone Pulotu created the, the, a massive uh, image of Hikuleo uh, last year in Tonga. He's also the one that created the one that I'm wearing of, of Hikuleo. So I want to give, um, you know, uh, commend these artists who are in the process of bringing back um, Hikuleo. To end, I want to sort of raise this question that the reclaiming of gender fluidity, of gender fluid deity, gender fluid otua, is also a recovering, a reclaiming of indigenous ecological knowledge. They go hand in hand. The destruction of um, gender fluid deity is also a destruction of ecological knowledge. And you can see this with its association with water, um, hikuleo, the marine life, the avian life, the food crops with taro and um, yam, weather, tafakula, around weather, and think about all the debate that we have today about climate change and the destruction that is happening to the environment, or even the Red Hill issue with the destruction and the um, uh, poisoning of the, of the water. These are important issues that are raised because they were associated in the Tongan case and in many of Moana Nui were associated with um, gender fluid uh, deity. And then of course, with um, astronomy. So the revival that has happened here and especially with the, um, the Kapai Mahu uh, exhibition has allowed me to sort of kind of think about this intersectionality, the intersecting of gender fluidity and also ecology. And with that, Aloha Pito, and thank you very much. Wow, mahalo nui. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and you know, I think we're gonna pass it to Kumuhina to sort of close us out in the presentation section of our of our program, even if it's just sharing mana'o or uh, sharing responses to to just the wealth and breadth of, of what we just of what we just received from our from our speakers. Um, so mahalo nui again, and, and I'll pass it on to Kumuhina. No laila, kaleo mahalo a nui o Ikea, no kokako hui ana. Mahalo a nui ya Adam Kiave, 
Manalo Camp, a Mahalo Anui Ya Oi. Devita, Mahalo Anui, no ke kaana ana mai, ka ike, me kana awao ya kakoa pauloa. I'd like to allow you all to digest what we have partaken. And rather than try to contribute to the body of knowledge that has been presented from both, uh, from two sides of this great family of the Moana Nui, we've heard about perspective from here in Hawaii, and we've heard perspective from Tonga. And what I'd like to invite you all to do is walk with me just on a journey of envisioning exactly what do we do with this knowledge? What do we do with this understanding? And for me, knowing, as Devita had mentioned, that our past is what informs us and the future is what remains yet to be seen. I envision that this knowledge, the, the reaffirmations that we are able to do, these connections and these relationships are now going to rely on us to take them forward. So the challenge therefore becomes, do we just simply juxtapose native knowledge with LGBTQI plus. That's just one angle. There's so many angles that you could take. But I'd like us to walk down this road. Um, for me, Hawaii is my mainland. Hawaii is my home. And so knowledge that centers me and roots me here is what's going to prevail and that means that the narrative the Kanaka narrative or the narrative of the Moana Nui we have been very privileged to have two sides of the family in fact it's for me it's an exceptional honor to have these two particular sides of family because they are both sides of family that are close to me and they've helped to inform how I see and how I feel about the world. The narrative of Mahu, of Aikane, the understandings of duality are elements that permeate Hawaii, Tonga, and if we look carefully, we will find them throughout the Pacific. The phenomena that occurs now, however, is that foreign introduced narratives tend to replace the native narrative. And that's something that I believe we need to give great consideration to. If you may not be of the Tonga or the Hawaii Islands, maybe you may not have that affinity, but especially for those of us who are from the Moana Nui, it's imperative for our identity that we, we give this some good real estate inside our minds and our hearts. So let me recount to you a, a story where not too, recent, uh, not too long ago, quite recent, there was an effort that uplifted transgender in the community and that transgender is the T out of LGBTQI. The sad part for me was that there was no mention of Mahu. There was no voice, there was no face to represent this and therefore yet again the native narrative is set aside or the native narrative is dismissed or the native narrative is not included in the articulation of its rightful place. And so, I ask all of you to please join me 
in considering what this means for how we look at things in the Pacific and what we empower and what we allow. Here in Hawaii, we have mahu, we have aikane, noho aikane, to have established relationships. As Adam Kiave pointed out, kaomi and kamehame ekolu. It is a clear example of iluakane, two males that have a bond and a connection that created controversy. And even during their time, they struggled. It is not unlike what we see in modern times, just the players have changed. And now some of the rules have changed. As I think about being someone who could wear the term mahu, I have found great power and great resolve in accepting the responsibility that comes with it. And so I leave you with this understanding. Kulana and kuleana. Can everybody please repeat after me? Kulana. Hanaho, kulana. Kuleana. Kuleana. Kulana is one's rank, is one's status, it is one's position. But with rank, status, and position comes what? Comes responsibility, comes duty and obligation. And that is something critical to think about when we look at relationships. This evening, we heard from Devita and Adam Kiave about relationships. In fact, um, who recalls the word that Devita had put up on the screen? Word begins with an H. It's a three letter word. And it's the same in Hawaiian. Did anybody catch that? Hoa. Hoa. In, in Hawaiian, um, when a native speaker asks you, Oh, ehina, peaoe, amitai, imitai, oe, oe hotei wale no, I hear to hoa. Where is your hoa? Where is your partner? And a hoa. It could be a husband, it could be a wife, it could be a male partner, a female partner. Your hoa is your hoa. So, where am I going? I ask you to consider that these relationships that we've heard about tonight, these roles that are fulfilled, what were the roles of these duality figures? What were the roles of the Aikane represented in Kamehameha III and Kaomi? They were quite important and very prominent roles in their place in history, time, and society. Yet, all the emphasis was placed on the element of it that's really quite irrelevant. Some of the most powerful figures that we could find in history of Hawaii and Tonga. And yet, their role and their responsibilities were diminished. Why? Because the views on sex and sexuality. You also heard, if you mention about Ia, the pronoun. It is clear then how we of the Moana Nui feel about gender, gender fluidity. There's great room for fluidity, but even our native people throughout the Moana Nui, we have been impacted through the collision with colonialism and with settler culture. So, what then is the challenge for all of us? The challenge is, do we empower ourselves to utilize mahu? Do we empower ourselves to honor Aikane? Do we empower ourselves to take this knowledge and to harness it and allow it to uplift us, to fortify us, to forward and, and promote our existence? Or do we simply just slap it on something and make it the exact equivalent to LGBTQI? It's a provocative question that I can't tell you how to feel. But for me, the slight difference between 
the two worlds is that there's a great emphasis placed on kulana and kuleana. The emphasis when speaking about duality within the Pacific cosmogony of our existence is role, rank, and status, and the duty, responsibility, and obligation that comes with it. The word ia tells us that the fluidity and the understandings have been here from time immemorial for us in the Moana Nui. What then do we do as a people? I think that this is a segue for us to walk into questions that may be either coming in online or that may be here in the room. And if I've pushed your buttons to think about this, then I succeeded in my sharing tonight. Are there any questions online? Not yet. Not yet. Not so, yet. Yes. Oh, yes. Hi. Thank you, everyone. This was so thought-provoking and, and fascinating. And I, I was curious if, in the story of Gyomi, if uh, the fact that you had someone who was art, you know, articulating a, a position against the church that was trying to decimate the culture had as much to do with the resistance to the relationship as the fact that the relationship was not heterosexual, right? Is, that, is there any any sense of how big a part that played in the, in the kind of political resistance to that relationship. Okay, mahalo for your question. So if I understand your question, you're asking about how that relationship, their romantic relationship played into resisting Basically, they were resisting settler colonialism um, <clears throat> politically. So the relationship, the, sorry, let me rephrase that. Comey um, began to question the church even before he had a relationship with um, Kamehameha III. Um, this, about a year prior to their relationship, he was already questioning Bingham and the missionaries on why they are in Hawaii. And he keeps it to himself at first, but he begins to question everything. And you have to remember that Kaomi was being trained to become a pastor. Um, he was actually sent to Kawaiha'o Church um, for training, and he was teaching Sunday school. Uh, Naomi, his, wife, um, his mother, uh, was also a very prominent school teacher, and she actually was one of Auna's um, fellow teachers in his school for royal children. Um, that's the other thing too, is the chief's children's school. There was already a chief's children's school before um, the one that was established by Cook. Um, <clears throat> Kamehameha III and the relationship with Kaomi pushed Kamehameha III to recognize uh, his own political lack of power, but also he was questioning whether or not this conversion from Hawaiian traditions to Christianity was really a good thing. Was it really Pono? Was it really in the interest of the people? And the relationship with Kaomi just be affirmed that it was it. And the fact that he was threatened with violence um, throughout that whole time period, really, on one hand, it be affirmed um, the resistance that Kamehameha the Third began to develop, but at the same time, it was also threatening him personally. And at, you know, after a year and a half of resisting, he had to give up because his there was a coup. There was going to be a coup attempt. Um, they were openly talking about killing the king, regicide, and Kalmi feared for the life of his lover, and he decided, you know what, we need to break up. We're, you need to just 
followed the missionaries because they're too powerful. And so he went into self-exile into Maui, and he dies about 1836. Um, according to the written sources, his, he, he was buried in an unmarked grave outside of Lahaina. But there's oral tradition to state that when Kaumi had died, Kamehameha III had actually brought his bones to Pohokaina at Iolani Palace um, in an unmarked grave over there. So Kaumi still maintained a closeness to the king, even though officially the, the king was married and um, had you know, adopted children and was living the way that the Christian missionaries had prescribed for him. But you know, if the oral tradition is true that Kaumi is still at Pohokaina, Adilani Palace, that also says a lot about Kaumi's influence over the development of the Hawaiian Kingdom that Kamehameha III had led. Mahalo. So we still, we don't have any uh, virtual questions yet, so if there's any questions in the audience, any other questions? While there are questions that you may be formulating, I'd like to give what I said just a little bit more direction. And I am referencing where we are here in Hawaii, here in the Pacific. All too often, foreign introduced narratives take a dominant role and don't always sit side by side, but simply replace or come in to supersede the narrative of native people and so again looking at the terms we have um fefine mo tangata tangata mo fefine male and female if we take a look at tongan cosmogony as well as the hawaiian we see that these themes are are quite um prevalent of of duality and this is something that we clearly understand so how can we allow this to move forward and what can we do to encourage and empower the native narratives to live on and to thrive into the next century um, have any of you uh, come up with yet another question or how about online yes Dean Thanks. I really, really appreciated uh, both of the contributions because there are areas of scholarship that are so difficult and so understudied because they were so controversial for so long that during much of the time there just wasn't any mention of it at all. So I actually wanted to ask both of you um, how you go forward and how you find references and how you find material when you're studying these historical questions that had been sort of not written about very much. Um, and so for Adam, I know for you, as I was thinking about the fantastic story of Kaomi, which is just to me one of the most fascinating I've heard of, but most of what's at least been published is was written 50 years later by people who really did not like Kaomi, or a lot, somewhat later. Um, so I was thinking it would be like trying to write the history of Stonewall and having only material from the, the American Family Association to go by, like everything else was erased, basically. And I'm wondering for you if there's any hope that there are still undiscovered resources, like missionary writings or logs, or any personal journal, journals or anything like that that might hopefully come to light at, at some point. And for Tavita, I guess my question is, I know that when Joe and I were in Tonga making Leites in Waiting, we, we tried to go to the library and look up materials like you were talking about and were just completely unsuccessful. So where, where are you looking for other materials and other thoughts about these historical Fascinating historical questions. Aloha for, um, mahalo for your question. Um, as far as sources, like when I was doing research on Kaumi, um, I don't know if you can see my top shelf. All of those books are diaries from missionaries. A lot of my research actually had come from Bingham and Judd. 
but there's also little bits here and there in Hawaiian language newspapers, which is why it's very important to have an understanding and grounding in both Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian language, because not all primary sources are written in English. Um, is there any hope for further research and maybe undiscovered diaries or something like that? Mm, I would like to think so. Um, because, you know, Omi was also a member of the, he was also part Tahitian. And Tahitian missionaries also had diaries that have not been translated yet either. So maybe in the future, we might learn more about Kaumi from his Tahitian half. Or maybe there might be more undiscovered diaries that we don't know of. But yeah, the primary um, narrative that we have of him comes from the opposition, from especially Bingham. And Bingham also left a number of sermons against uh, Kaumi, which also paint the picture of Kaumi, of course, from his light. But at least it tells us that Kaumi was such an important figure that the missionaries were writing sermons against him at the pulpits. And this isn't just like a minor figure. You know, they literally call him an apostate, an infidel. And at one point, Bingham calls him the devil. So, yeah, I would hope that we can one day recover um, the narrative of Kaumi from his own perspective somehow. But at the same time, we need to reclaim him as a Hawaiian historical figure. You know, uh, for me, um, I take both written sources and oral sources uh, as equal. Uh, both are um, equally valid to, to me as a, as a researcher, especially the researching the deep history aspect of um, Tonga. So some are written by um, early anthropologists. Um, they were the ones who I was citing from the 1920s. They are Bishop Museum's publications, actually, in the 1920s. Um, but there are others that are just uh, oral traditions that were passed down. Um, from you know, being raised by my grandparents, but also uh, being raised and hearing all the stories about Fehuluni uh, shifting back and forth between male and female. Um, so there are both of that kinds of uh, sources. There are also sources that are in Tongan that are not translated to English. Um, so uh, one of the sources I cite was Masiu Moala's Efinanga, which is a uh, book about Tongan uh, traditions that are only in Tongan, but not in English. And so I'm also pulling from, from Tongan language um, sources um, in that way. Um, I'm sure there are also missionary uh, you know, sources. I, I did not use a lot of missionaries in this particular presentation. Most of my sources were just academics and then um, elders, um, Tongan elders um, that I've used for, for this uh, presentation. But I'm sure there are others out there, Dean, that could emerge in the future. Mahalo nui. <laughs> mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo ya oi, Brandon Kioni Bundag. Um, Ehina, heaha, ke kulana o na mahu, ma keiawa. Apehea ka kua pau e holo mua, ka koo ke la kulana. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. So, what, what exactly is the status of Mahu in this current time? And how do we forward this? So, that's the perfect question to set me up to continue to honor these two scholars who have shared with you this evening. Um, Tulowat. I think I found the words for what I was trying to say earlier, and that is that as island people, and depending on what islands you come from in the Pacific, we are under constant onslaught of intrusion of foreign perspective, foreign culture, foreign ideology, and foreign ways, which doesn't have to be a bad thing, except that 
what some people understand through the terms cancel culture has been already occurring to the native narrative for a very long time. And so the current status of at least Mahu, I'll pull only from Hawaii. And through much work that has been done by Mahu in the community, reinstating the word Mahu to be a respectful word and a term that it has positive meaning is on a, on a slow but sure uptick. And we regain the rightful use of this word. As someone who grew up with this term being used as a weapon against me and others like me. I am thankful for the works of the Mahu that I have been connected to and doing work in the community to gather our, our Mahu people and to forward the understanding first and foremost amongst us so that those, for those whom Mahu would apply that we could feel good about this term and not feel hurt or feel ashamed or feel bad by wearing this term. Also, um, to forward it and to promote it is to tell the stories and to echo and cite the examples that have been shared by scholars like Adam Chiave and Tevita. Of course, cite the scholar who did the work. That's always key. Cite that scholar. But nonetheless, recount the story. And that's why for me personally, it's an absolute honor because now I get to have even greater insight from the sharing tonight. And I can start to recount this story to others. And that's what everyone in this room and everyone online can do. You can say, you know, I was a part of a wonderful um, session. It was a, sh a sharing session with knowledge that was presented by scholars from the Pacific. And they taught us this. And that is how we can take small steps towards ensuring that we forward and uplift not only the kulana of mahu but the kulana of mahu the kulana of duality and the kulana of having both male and female and sometimes flowing this way and flowing that way and it being okay sometimes in western society we're categorized and expected to act and be in a certain format but We've learned tonight, thanks to the sharing, that the space in between male and female and this duality, this understanding of, of two sides and somewhere in the middle, we see that there's great room for all of us in our communities and in our circles. Um, is there any question that has come in yet? Um, any other thoughts? Yes, here in the audience. Thank you. Is there a point where um, transgender and mahu began to be sort of com conflated as the same thing? Uh, where people started, you mentioned that when people, you know, take the acronym LGBTQIA and they erase mahu, it's perhaps connected to them just deciding that Mahu is transgender. Is that, when did that start happening? I, I think perhaps to answer this question, and I, I'm not sure what my colleagues here in the room uh, would say, but it's about ensuring that when we do things, especially here in the Pacific, that we uplift and forward the native narrative and to not just assume that everything translates over and that everything is in the same approach and the same perspective and to allow the narrative to have its time and its place and to not be secondary. I think that's what, um, what I was getting at. Um, there are many other instances where the native narrative um, gets 
pushed aside or not recognized at all. Um, Devita, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, for me, uh, language is a, a vision, a perspective yeah, um, of the world. So, um, and translation is always messy. Um, and, and then when you conflate the two languages, you're sometimes erasing some of those important perspectives or vision within that um, particular uh, group. So I, I, I try to um, use as much of the native language as possible when identifying and, and labeling, um, just because that's the, the term that comes with all the perspective and the knowledge that are associated. Um, and of course, LGBTQ or transgender or even gender fluidity that I use, I mean, they come with their own language and, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't work. So that's sort of kind of the, the, the way that I, I see the, the use of, of those labels, yeah. Malo, Adam Kiave. One moment, Alia. No. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you. Well, for me, this is also related to who writes history because there's a biasness. You know, if a person is an English speaking um, person and they're writing the history of Hawaii, um, they're going to primarily choose to write. Uh, their book based on English language written sources. Sometimes maybe oral traditions, but it's going to be in English. When you go to Hawaiian language newspapers, however, you get a totally different perspective on the same historical event. Like one thing that um, Dr. Doi Noi Silva points out in her book is um, there's a parade um, in honor of King Kalakaua. The English language um, article list, oh, there's some floats with some fish and some people dressed in old style Hawaiian warrior outfits. When you read the Hawaiian of that same event, it lists the mo'olelo that the floats were um, representing. It lists the names of the warriors who were supposed to be, um, you know, um, depicted on these floats. It's a totally different perspective. And for far too long, our history has been written by people who have been in the service of the state, such as Kai Kim Do. Uh, he was a state archivist and friend of Sanford Do. And even, you know, with the Bishop Museum, its first director, um, he was not particularly fond of native Hawaiians and he encouraged the looting of caves. But luckily we, Bishop Museum has reformed. Um, <clears throat> thanks to the Maori scholar, um, Tirangi Hiroa, but uh, there are certain terms that do not translate well into English, and that comes with any language. Like, for example, I speak Hawaiian, I also speak Tagalog. There's terms in Filipino that do not translate very well into English. Um, there's certain terms in Hawaiian that do not translate well into English, because English is a very, very precise language, and it, there's a whole history to its own, you know, um, terms. Within Hawaiian, for example, mahu is a very broad term. It's a very broad term because Hawaiians saw it as, in my perspective, Hawaiians saw the term had to be broad in order to not limit people to who they are. Mahalo, mahalo. So we have two questions uh, coming from our virtual audience. The first one that came in was, what can we, the audience, do to reclaim the word mahu? Maybe I'll hand that to Kumihina. What can we do to reclaim the word mahu? Hmm. I think we can start by encouraging its proper use and by not endorsing any of its application in a pejorative or, or derogatory manner. That is one clear way that we can embrace this. And 
can't speak for anyone else except myself. My own personal growth and acceptance of this word has been a long work in progress. We're only now, and I just made 50, only now am I at a very comfortable place. And I think what solidified being comfortable is the work that is in our exhibit here at the museum, Kapai Mahu. It is also supported by the scholarly works of Devita Kaili, Adam Kave, Manalo Camp, and for those whom understand that Mahu stands shoulder to shoulder with Kane and Wahine, Tangata Mofefine. And we're not a subordinate sect. We're not, uh, we're not secondary. We're not something to be hidden. And it's okay to talk about us. And it's okay to use that word. Someone had asked me, how do I feel about a non-Kanaka, a non-ethnic Hawaiian using this term? And I feel that it's open for people who live here to, if you identify in that way and if you acknowledge that it comes with a certain feel of how we live our lives. And it comes with a certain feel of how we articulate our existence. And so if this is consistent with you, then of course, by all means. You know, as um, Adam mentioned earlier, not everything translates exactly. But therein lies the responsibility for all of us to understand this and to know that it's not just simply replace near equivalence perhaps but that's a very nuanced uh you know uh, a very nuanced thing um devita did you have any thought on on reclaiming a, a word um reclaiming that space of duality um i mean for me is um usage which is i think it's happening now but more also is the narrative that are associated with the, with the term. Um, as you can see, as I was showing with like Fafafine and the way that it was defined in the dictionary as a monster, that narrative has to be replaced by something like Kapai Mahu and the new narratives. And it's actually not a, a new narrative, it's sort of kind of reclaiming, recovering, a, sort of a restoring the the meaning that was very empowering in the past and then bringing that meaning back and using it today and, and circulating and I, I think I'm also speaking to scholar like myself that our writing cannot be in journals it has to be also in public and making sure that it's accessible and that people are, are also um, able to to read the work that we do um, I'm not saying that writing in journals are bad I'm just saying do both you still write in journals, but also oh, oh. in media, in areas where the work is more accessible to other people. I'm pretty active on social media. I try to do this as to use the words as a way of sharing it widely with, with, within the mass. So that's my... Uh, Malo. Malo, Devita. And, you know, that actually is a, is a great kind of jumping off point to the second question, another question that's coming in. Um, which is, it says, Kotaki uh, Atu for the panel, um, but what differences and similarities do you see in how Hawaiian and Tongan societies today deal in better understanding and reclaiming mahu, uh, faka fifine, uh, faka tangata? Um, and, you know, it, this question is more about um, speaking to gender fluidity and not so much on language and the word is being discussed, but this was, this is a, yes. I'm sorry, what's the last part of the question? The last part is just a qualification that um, I think the question is, is sort of more about gender fluidity and not so much about the language. Um, but, you know, the, the, the key first question was what differences and similarities do you see in how Hawaiian and Tongan societies today deal in better understanding and reclaiming mahu, faka uh, fifine, and faka tangata? I'm going to have to rely on, on sole personal experience, too low. Um, I will pull from two experiences. 
from being in the Ni'ihau community, which is the last completely uh, Hawaiian-speaking community that we have, and then uh, secondly, um, my experiences in and around Tongan community circles. Um, amongst Ni'ihauans, uh, I first learned a different application of the word mahu because it was my Ni'ihau mom who said, Oh, Helen, I'm making a more mahu. Oh, are you going to go with those mahu? And it was an honest question. Are you going to go with them? Meaning, are we going to go and do something together? But she referenced it in that way. And then I said, oh, that, that question in and of itself meant that she was using it in a way to have it be its proper form. It's an adjective. It's a description. Are you going with... She didn't have to say kane or wahine. She said mahu because she recognized that there was duality in the folks that I was engaging with and I was going to get in a car and go. Um, when I first showed up with uh, the kane that I was in a relationship with at the time and they said, Oh, ehina, tohoa no teho kanakanui eh? I said, is this your partner? Oh, he's a tall fellow, isn't he? But there was no shade. There was no discrimination. There was no like, ill kind of reaction. It was simply, oh, is this your partner? And then after that, they would always ask, Ehina, Aloha. And they would say, and how many times have you come back to Kauai, gone back and forth, and you're not bringing your partner with you? Oh, so sad. And they would criticize me for not coming with him. But you see, if it, were some, if it was expressed in a way that expressed disdain and distaste for a mahu having a man who, for all purposes and intents, was like someone else who is a a uh, cisgender man going with a transgender woman, um, then it would have come out in, in its articulation. Um, in Tonga, I will never forget, I'm walking uh, through Loto Nuku Alofa, right in the town, and right by um, Talamahu, the market there, uh, there was an elderly gentleman walking down the sidewalk, and he, he's walking like this, sticks out his hand, and shakes my hand, he says, Hello, you the individual who are like a lady. And he smiled, and he kept on going. You know, and he greeted me. Now, that's clearly um, evidence that this man understood that at the time, he clearly identified me as someone who was and he said, and carried on his way. Um, but I also learned through Tongan circles that there's acceptance for me because of fulfillment of duty and that my role, my rank, my status and in the family, in the church and in the circles that I am, it's not determined by my expression and my articulation of my life but it's by fulfillment of kuleana and by undertaking of service and availing myself to the needs of others. Because of the Pacific way, that is how we analyze and assess the value of people by what we do. Um, and I hope that answers the question. Mahalo nui. I think we might have time for maybe one more question. So I'm wondering if anyone has, has any in the audience. Yes? Or no? Oh, okay. Joe. Nobody else does, has a question. I, I really just wanted to express my gratitude to Vita and Adam, to you, for you know, the incredible uh, dedication that you have to these subjects and to examining history and bringing these lessons forward. And what really struck me as you were talking was a question, actually meaning you are looking at crimes of history. 
and the ways in which you know, people across the generations were affected by what we would today call prejudice, bigotry, different forms of discrimination. And as I think about where we are now, the communities that you look at in the research you talked about tonight, those communities of today are still facing the same things from the very same uh, perpetrators of this kind of violence. And to me, I really appreciated your term violence because I think violence has applications not just in the physical sense, but in the social, in the economic, in the political, in the cultural and social sense as well. And in, I think, most cases, whether it was the periods you were examining or now, among the main sources of this kind of violence that are still quite active today are the world's so-called great religions. So I guess as historians looking back at how such violence was inflicted then, how do you feel knowing that the communities that you have shown such great compassion and interest in and for continue to face the same violence from the same actors? Like how, how, how does that sit with you? How do you hope that the work that you're so you know, dedicated to putting forward will help perhaps advance things even just a little bit in these you know, very troubled times? But thanks again for your work. Mahalo, Mahalo Joe. Uh, excellent question. And um, one that um, you know, I've had uh, think about this question for, for quite some time. Um, you know, for me, uh, my role as a, a scholar and someone who, who researched, uh, especially in this particular area, you know, the application of this knowledge is important to me. So one of the things that I do is I try to create a safe space um, uh, for people who um, identify as Fafefine, uh, Fafeleiti, Mahu, uh, within the arena where I teach or where I am at, um, and and you know show show love and caring for for, for them, um, I think that uh, it's it's important for us who um, enter this particular space to create that kind of safe safe place. And I and I also see that in history when I'm looking back at the. Some of the sources I see people that were also doing this back in the, you know, in the 1800s and so forth. So I think it's not something unique or something that is different. I think uh, every community uh, has its own complexity, and there are always um, people within the community who are also doing other things to um, maybe think about ways to reconfigure that community to be more loving and caring uh, for for others and. I position myself within that particular um, area. Um, I see myself as, as trying to be an ally and to empower uh, within, within that particular role. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult, it's challenging, um, but I, I think that there are many others who, and others who've done it way better than, than I am. So that would be my answer for, for that. Um, Malo. Other responses or any any actually maybe closing statements from our guests from our from our panelists today as we as we you know wrap up and and um, really sit with all of the gifts that that you've given us today. Adam Kiave. <clears throat> well, first off, I identify myself as Mahu. Uh, this the Mahu community is my kauhale. It is the community that I am part of. Um, as someone who is actively on social media, I do get attacks sometimes from people from Hawaii about um, some of the history. Whenever I put on something about Mahu history or something like that, guaranteed I'm going to get something in my inbox that says, stick with talking about real history. Don't talk about people and their sexual preferences. I got that just yesterday, in fact. People are not comfortable, some people are not comfortable about talking about this history, but it is a part of who we are. It is a part of 
our national history. Like for me, above all, I am Kanaka Maori. I am Hawaiian. Hawaii is my nation. And this is a part of the culture and the history of my nation. And why shouldn't I talk about the things that my ancestors were not ashamed of? Because they weren't. Because Mahu was a part of who we are, were, and continue to be. And, you know, with the homophobia, particularly from Hawaiians, sometimes I do get upset, I get hurt. Sometimes I get angry. But I also realize that it comes from the hurt and the pain and the trauma of colonialism. It comes from the place where Hawaiians as a people, we were told for 100 years that we're not, you know, that we're a childlike people, unworthy to even tell our own history. That, you know, we are a Stone Age people. And that's the same thing with, that happens within the Mahu community, is that we do need more Mahu to be researchers and to research these types of histories. We need to also be the ones to tell our stories as well, uh, with the support, of course, of our allies like Dr. Ka Kaili. But at some point, we need to reclaim, you know, when we're talking about earlier the question about reclaiming the word Mahu, that is how we reclaim it. We have to be the ones to tell our stories. We have to be the ones to find our stories. We have to be the ones who live our stories. Mahalo. Um, for me, I just want to thank uh, Kumuhina, Dean, Joe, uh, Daniel, and others, uh, Bishop Museum, for you know creating this space and allowing us to have this Dalanoa conversation about a very important topic. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been researching Tongan Otua for many years, um, going all the way back to my dissertation days. I, I wrote about Tongan Otua. I, my book has a whole several chapters on it. But this particular area of the Otua, the gender fluidity, I did not really um, talk much about. So the Kapai Mahu exhibition has allowed me to actually really talk about this area and write about it and to think deeply more about it. And so I'm just, I'm just grateful, just grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to talk about this and to just talk about, the, because this is the truth, this is the, um, you know, this is part of the, of the culture. Um, I'm, you know, there are very few Tongan scholars who are talking about this. Uh, might be one of, maybe the only one at this particular point. <laughs> You're so the I, only I do one. feel, uh, you know, in a very lonely place, but I, I want to thank those who have been supportive and been encouraged, encouraging me, uh, Kumuhina and others. And, you know, I, I, I see Isaiah and Rebecca, who's here, my, my wife and my uh, sister-in-law, who's here. They, they've been the kind of, the, you know, supportive of me, allowing me to be able to explore this particular space. So with that, malo apito. Mahalo anui itahale ho iti iti opi hopa to the Bishop Museum. Nukoloko mai te imita olu olu ta awamo ane ite ya kuleana eho ita vehe ane ite ya hale nei no toka to tu tala ana kui namanao tu ta tu ta pono epiliana no ia papahana o ya hoi o ya mea o ka duality mahu and all of the things that we've heard. Mahalo anui ya oi Devita, mahalo anui ya oi Adam Kiave, to the both of you, mahalo anui ya olua no to olua ka ana ana mai i to olua ite me to olua na a wow. Um, truth be told, I actually wondered whatever would I say sitting on a panel with these two um, brilliant scholars to me. And how could I sit on a panel with them? But I should actually say mahalo to them for allowing me to share this time and space um, here. And hopefully the one contribution again is, what do we all do? What do we all do to uplift and honor the understandings that are rooted here in the Moana Nui? How do we forward this knowledge? And how do we also honor those whom have 
been brave enough to put forward this knowledge. Um, Yavita, I, I must give focus to you for a moment because in the Tongan community, while there is, you know, there are the pockets of acceptance and embracing, there's still so much that is supportive of violence and negativity and and looking down upon people like me. And you are the lone brave one in the Tongan community who's saying these things. There's no one else. So I'm very thankful that you have made this a part of the passion and commitment to the scholarly work that you do. And uh, to you, Adam Calve, for you as well. Because you went and you, you looked in these obscure records, church records and, and missionary records, and you find these detailed accounts of these lesser known or not known at all bits of history that help to inform and guide us what we do. So, um, honor to the both of you, but also mahalo and respect to the Bishop Museum for creating this opportunity and for all of you who gave of your time both online and here present in this hale. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo nui. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing this space with us tonight. Thank you to our virtual audience for joining us and just infinite gratitude to our speakers, Hina, Tevita, Adam Keave, um, and Kumu Hina really can't, enough, enough, not, not, uh, there isn't enough that can be said about, about your, what you bring to this conversation and to this community and to our spaces. So thank you so much. Mahalo, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that my two colleagues here in the room Dr. Dean Hamer and Joe Wilson. Without this team that we call Kanaka Pakipika, um, our ability to produce works like Kapayamahu and others that we've gotten behind would not be possible. So great acknowledgement and great appreciation for their tremendous role in also helping to bring these moments like this to fruition. Absolutely. Mahalo. Thank you. Right, have a beautiful evening, anyone, everyone. Aloha nui. Mahalo. Mm -hmm.